Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our South Press webinar on therapies and vaccine development for emerging and re-emerging diseases. I'm Amanda Monahan, a scientific editor at Cell Host and Microbe, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. The emergence of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 pandemic has exposed our continued susceptibility to microbial pathogens and gaps in our therapeutic arsenal. During recent regional outbreaks and the global pandemic, scientists have demonstrated how rapidly we can now adapt to re-emerging and emerging threats. In this webinar, Matthew Sullivan from the NIAID, Mike Diamond from Washington University of St. Louis, and Bryony Graham from the NIAID will illustrate the concept of bench to bedside research by collectively laying out the avenues necessary for vaccines and therapeutics to, prog to progress from preclinical work to patients. The talks will take us from the preclinical development through deployment and will exemplify how lessons and knowledge from distinct pathogens and outbreaks can drive progress against emerging threats. Following the talks, there will be a panel session with our speakers to continue the discussion of the vaccine and therapeutic pipelines. The goal is to demonstrate the complexity of vaccine and therapeutic development while celebrating how far we as a scientific community have come. Before we get started with the talks, we have a few practical points. Each of our speakers will talk for approximately 15 minutes. Following the talks, we'll have a Q&A session that covers all three presentations. If you have a question for any of the speakers, just click on the question tab at the top of the display and type it in. You can enter a question at any time. There's no need to wait until the end. We will try our best to pass on as many of your questions to the speakers as we can during the Q&A. We would also like to thank you, our to thank our speakers for making the time to join us today, and also our sponsor, Sino Biological, for supporting this webinar. And now I will pass the ball to our first speaker, Nancy Sullivan. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, um, thanks, Amanda. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation uh, to speak at this webinar because with the recent Ebola outbreaks and the current SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, we've obviously been giving a lot of thought for how can we do better at preparing for emerging and re-emerging diseases. And so what I'd like to do today is to try to frame at least how we're thinking about that. And as a start, you know, when we, when we think about different viruses that we need to prepare for, the list is very extensive. And that's just viral diseases, not bacterial. And we have on the viruses known to cause human disease about 23 virus families. And you can see that a little bit more than half of those have licensed vaccines to at least prototype viruses within those families. But if you look at the viruses for which we don't have uh, vaccines and therapeutics, with the exception here of Ebola virus that has a newly licensed VSV vaccine from Merck. The others really were still working hard to try to prepare for what might come next. And this doesn't even include the viruses that are not known to cause human disease, which can be emerging. And so Today, we're going to focus on two of those viruses that are known to cause human disease to look at lessons learned for, for how we can accelerate our preparedness. And when we think about that at the VRC, at least, you know, we, we're trying to leverage prior research and combine this with preparedness to accelerate um, our ability to have vaccines and therapies against emerging pathogens. And we start thinking about surveillance and discovery as being a critical part of this that I think more recently the broad research community has also begun to appreciate how important that component is, even though many of us will focus on the next bullet point, which is the biology, um, pathogenesis, and immunity. And then, of course, product development and manufacturing are also key downstream events that, that we need to think about as we're going through this exercise and preparing along with clinical evaluation and intervention de deployment. And the VRC was conceived to help cover some of these areas. And so we've been thinking about it in this way for a long time where we begin um, 
a lot of the initial initial basic research right here on the, the NIH Bethesda campus and bring this into process development, GMP manufacture, clinical trials, and immune assays, and all of that feeds back into the basic research in trying to understand the basic biology structure replication strategy of viruses to identify vulnerabilities for vaccines and therapeutics. And one of our first examples of, of trying to harness this, this structure to be more prepared is Ebola virus. And I'm sure this audience is, is familiar with the 2014-16 outbreak that led to almost 30,000 cases and, of course, many, many deaths. But before that, there was a number of outbreaks, beginning in 1976, the Yambuku outbreak, which, you know, made the news at the time but probably didn't spur a lot of research. It was looked at as a one-off and probably not going to happen again. And, in fact, it wasn't until 1995 that there was another big outbreak in Kikwit. And that was the point at which, shortly after that, we realized that this could be a reemerging pathogen. And that has borne out when you look at the 2000s, where these outbreaks are every year or two. So it's very predictable that this is going to be a reemerging pathogen. And so how do we deal with this in terms of both vaccines and therapeutics? And the talk today is going to focus on a therapeutic MAV-114 that we developed. Um, and it's important to, I think, throughout these presentations, recognize that the prior research is so important to informing what we do. And we may not have an appreciation for the need to do that research until it becomes a crisis. And that's where we need to, I think, focus some of our attention. And so JJ Mayembe, back in 1995, did something that at the time was unheard of. These outbreaks are very chaotic. Um, and he actually uh, initiated and completed an eight-patient study in, in infected patients where he showed that he could infuse convalescent plasma from survivors. And it appeared that there was a survival benefit because only one of the eight transfused patients died, and the overall case fatality rate for that outbreak was about 80%. Now, of course, that wasn't placebo-controlled. And naturally, there was a lot of skepticism about, you know, whether this was truly an effect of the convalescent plasma. And indeed, in follow-up monkey studies, um, there was one study performed in um, the Vector Labs in Russia that showed a hyperimmune equine serum provided a survival benefit to baboons. But then in this country, a lot of the work was done um, either at USAMRID, led by Peter Jarling, or also studies at CDC, which were really the only two BSL-4 labs in this country. But really what was observed was the same thing over and over. So in control monkeys, you can see that they die within about a week. And if you treat them um, with a, either a convalescent plasma or some other mixture of immune um, components, the, the animals can keep viremia controlled for a certain period of time, but in that red dashed line, you can see that as the equine serum is cleared, then the animals are no longer able to control. So it really was a conundrum in the field for whether or not antibodies could indeed protect. And one of the reasons that, that we started thinking about this at the very basic virological level is that, of course, if you understand the, the virus entry pathway, you can try to identify points of vulnerability that might be susceptible to antibody therapy. And Ebola poses a, a fairly unique challenge, and that is we normally would target the envelope glycoprotein and try to inhibit that initial attachment and entry event. With Ebola, that initial attachment is via multiple molecules, so it's not possible really to target one molecular interaction. And indeed, what happens is that that, that triggers a very ma rapid macropenocytosis, where the virus is taken up into endosomes and lysosomes. And the receptor binding domain that would be the target of a monoclonal antibody isn't even exposed until late endosomes after cathepsin cleavage to expose that receptor binding domain by elimination of a large part of that protein that's protecting the RBD, allowing then uh, binding to the internal NPC1 receptor. So that point of vulnerability is once the virus is deep, deep, deep inside the cell. And so the question is, how do we find an antibody that can bind to the native trimer, 
stay bound with high affinity under low pH conditions of the endosomes and lysosomes, and then also retain its binding after a lot of the epitopes are cleaved off during that cathepsin cleavage event in order to bind that RBD event. And so with, um, with Ebola, one of the nice things is that we can easily pseudotype it onto other viruses, and in this case, we were using lentiviruses. And unlike some glycoproteins, we can pre-cleave that trimer with cathepsins, and it remains fully active. So it allowed us to test the hypothesis with um, two antibodies from Dennis Burton, one from a human, KZ52, and one from a monkey survivor where we asked what is the neutralization when we look at um, the native trimer on the virion versus neutralization on the pre-cleaved trimer. And what you can see is that KZ52 loses its neutralization capacity against the cleaved form, but this other monkey survivor antibody retained its ability to neutralize that cleaved form, which says in principle, it should be possible to identify an antibody that binds to both the native and the cleaved um, trimer to block that RBD event. Now, while those antibodies weren't available for further development, we actually um, worked with J.J. Mayembe um, at the National Institutes of Biomedical Research in Kinshasa in Subway Mulangu, who um, really have been our longtime collaborators, starting with work that Barney Graham did with them on monkeypox. And so Barney and Julie, along with Subway and Professor Mambe, identified um, a survivor that was a good candidate. Even though this survivor had been infected many, many years before, we thought it was a good candidate for trying to find B cells making um, important antibodies because this survivor had very severe infection for a number of weeks. And after resolution of his symptoms, he went back into the ETUs to treat patients and possibly had additional antigen exposures. So as we think about what we were looking for for antibodies in this survivor, again, we went back to the basic biology of the virus. And so what I'm showing you here is the GP trimer. It's three monomers. Two of these are shown as space filling, and the other is a ribbon diagram where you can see above it the linear schematic of GP. And what happens in that cathepsin cleavage event is that we lose a lot of the protein. In fact, we, we end up going from 150 kilodalton protein to about an 18 kilodalton protein. So many of those potential epitopes are lost during this cleavage event. And what that does is it allows um, exposure of the receptor binding pocket and binding to NPC1. And all of this work to, to understand this entry pathway was critical to our being able to identify an antibody that might be able to block that. And so MAP114, um, we were able to show could protect monkeys. And of course, the first thing we did was um, look at the crystal structure and how it's binding. We did this with Jason uh, McClellan and, and Morgan Gilman. And um, what I'm showing in purple at the bottom is just uh, an antibody that we used to co-crystallize with GP and MAP114. But the striking thing about MAB114 is that it has a, a completely vertical approach to the trimer and nestles right down into that chalice of the trimer. And that blue and the yellow is the core of the glycoprotein that contains the receptor binding domain. So this was a good candidate for actually having that be the mechanism of protection. And when we look top down, you can see how tightly it binds because really you can't even see the trimer below the three FABs that are bound. So we asked the question then, um, how might this be uh, working? And we looked first at whether MAV114, um, when we look at a little bit higher resolution where it's binding, you can see that it's, it's engaging near the receptor binding domain, but it also has context contacts um, in this glycan cap in yellow that's removed. So the first question we asked was whether it could actually remain bound after internalization and cathepsin cleavage. And what I'm showing you on the right-hand side is that if you look at the full-length GP and intermediate or that cleaved form on the far right, by immunoprecipitation, we can see that MAB114 uh, retains that binding. And remember, we want something that binds both to the native trimer and to that fully cleaved form, which this seems to do. But it also has to do that at low pH, remember, because that cleaved form is appearing late in the endosomes. And so when we look by octet, 
at the affinity of MAB114 binding at either neutral or low pH, we can see that it's still binding with very high affinity. So that, that um, convinced us that it could possibly block receptor binding. And so we asked that question directly, um, again, first in an immunoprecipitation experiment where we had a couple of controls, 13C6 is a component of ZMAP, this is the cocktail that was used in the 2014 Ebola outbreak, um, that binds in a similar location but at a slightly different angle and could potentially block receptor binding. And the KZ52, which binds to the base, and of course we don't expect that to, to block receptor binding. And when we look by immunoprecipitation, neither KZ52 nor 13C6 block that interaction and immunoprecipitation um, of the receptor and GP. But when we add uh, MAV114, we can see now we've disrupted that interaction between GP and its receptor NPC1. We can also look by octet in a finer way. And if we look at inhibition of NPC1 binding now, 13C6 doesn't inhibit binding. NPC1 inhibits binding to itself, and MAV114 has very high efficiency inhibition of, of that event. And you can see um, George Gile published the crystal structure of NPC1 um, shown in teal, and we look at MAB114 and magenta, and clearly those two molecules couldn't occupy GP at the same time. And so when we look at the, the um, epitope for MAB114, it's really sitting right down inside that RBD, and it's a very conserved epitope, which is good when we think about the potential for developing resistance, and so we looked at isolates from 1976 to 2020 and didn't see variation in this epitope, suggesting that in nature, changes to that epitope are not tolerated. So we had done monkey studies all along the way, and the first monkey studies were several, infusion of anti several infusions of antibodies very early after infection. But um, there were a couple of things that we realized. If we wanted to this to be a useful therapeutic, we had to be able to give it a little bit later. We don't usually see patients um, right after they're infected. And also, in conversations with Billy Fisher, who had done some therapeutics delivery in the 2014 outbreak, he made the point that it would really be a game changer if we could have a simplified treatment that could be given once and protect. And so we did this experiment in monkeys giving the antibody on either day one or day five and showed complete protection um, by a single infusion of the antibody. And it was pretty striking to us that, that the viremia declined very rapidly. So after the antibody was given, we could see the viremia go to, to zero in about five days. So, you know, again, what we think about in terms of preparedness, you know, how do we accelerate this timeline? So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how this actually uh, moved through development. So the early monkey studies informed our decision. We thought it was promising to advance this into clinical testing, and we at the VRC made show clones. But this is where the partnerships become very important. So we don't have the capability to bring things into advanced development, and we collaborated with DARPA, um, who subcontracted with Metamune to take these clones forward and do clone selection. Um, then uh, Metamune subcontracted further for manufacturing, and it was over a period of about um, two years where that process took place. That's a long time when we're thinking about preparedness. Um, during that time, we were doing the monkey dosing op optimization, and once we found out the dosing, Julie Ledgeward and Martin Godinsky here at the VRC very quickly, you know, translated that into a phase one, and they uh, planned this ahead so that when the vials of MAV114 released, they were ready for recruitment. Now, this is a period, as you can see, of about three years. Luckily, that happened because um, there was an outbreak shortly after Julie um, finished the recruitment of the phase one. Um, that outbreak, um, you know, made us realize that we needed to try to get 114 to Congo. There was a request. We shipped it. We did training. John Masasi and Laura Novick um, flew to Kinshasa for training. Um, and this demonstrated the principle that from sequence to delivery, if you're prepared, that can go very quickly. And it happened in about a month. Um, so we went from sequence to treatment in a month. But what happened was the outbreak ended, which was good. They used traditional contact tracing and quarantine methods, which we need to think about, obviously, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, unfortunately, there was a new outbreak about a week later. 
uh, because we had pre-positioned MAB114 there, they were able now from sequence to treatment um, to get that to patients in about 10 days. And that was because Subway and Olivier actually went into these war-torn areas and delivered this antibody to the first um, dozen patients under compassionate use. So um, we um, then, of course, Cliff Lane um, and WHO and INRB worked very hard to get this into a randomized control trial. Um, that took about three months because there was lots of discussion about what is the appropriate way to do this. Is it, is it ethical to have a control arm when you're in the middle of the outbreak? And so what they did cleverly was use ZMAP as a control arm. So all patients were treated. They were using four drugs, one to one to one, um, in the randomization. And two of those drugs, MAB114 and Regeneron, resulted in a significantly greater chance of survival when you compare it to either the control group ZMAP and remdesivir didn't quite work as well as it seems to be for SARS-CoV-2 against Ebola. And when you looked at early treatment, you could get um, about a 90% efficacy rate. So now in terms of preparedness, what do we do? So it's not over. I think this really, again, we want to leverage these data to better understand how can we improve these antibodies for Ebola Zaire, and in fact, can we have lessons learned to help us prepare for Sudan virus or Marburg virus? And when we look at some of the differences, for example, between Regeneron, which is thir three, three antibodies, and ZMAP, which didn't work as well, which is three antibodies, you can look at the source, which is obviously different. It's humanized versus um, Balbsy mice. The antigen is different in each case, but that shouldn't matter because the conservation is very high across Ebola, um, GP, and different outbreaks. How the antibodies are induced. Um, how they're produced. It could be that production in tobacco plants has been a problem, certainly for manufacturing of ZMAP, but we don't know in efficacy in humans that might matter for post-translational modifications. The administration was different. A single infusion versus three infusions in a very sick patient could be less well tolerated. And then, of course, it's very important for us to work out the mechanism of how these are working. So, when we think about, again, how do we apply these lessons to preparedness, well, when there's a, a new outbreak, of course, we've got many more technologies now that help us identify virus sequences quickly. Can we use genome organization and have a prototype in the virus um, family to really anticipate what might be a good antiviral, what might be a good monoclonal antibody based on these properties and prototype viruses? And then, of course, looking at pathogenesis, pathogenesis and immune clearance mechanisms to help inform how we approach vaccines. So maybe gene-based vaccines, which are self-adjuvanting, are good in some cases. Maybe we need protein, BLP, or nanoparticles where we can tune the response with the adjuvant we use. The main point being all of this research is going to help us to categorize viruses into, into categories that might let us respond more rapidly. And when we think about the response and how to do that more rapidly, I think Ebola, again, is a good example of where we need to accelerate that. So if we look at publications after the first outbreak, it's pretty sparse. There was obviously some work going on. That ratcheted up again in 1995 with the next outbreak, and this is where we started our work. Um, but it wasn't until 2014 where this really increased a lot. And what we want to do is shift that curve left so that our preparation really has a lot of this research and we're ready to respond very quickly. And um, there's a nice review published um, by Barney, John, and, and Tony showing how we've really improved our ability to respond quickly. So if you look at the first SARS outbreak when it took 20 months from sequence to phase one, now with Zika, three, three and a quarter months um, to get to the phase one, and now with SARS-CoV-2, it's two months. So we're really making progress, and I think the next two talks are going to um, show you how that's being done. Um, so I'm going to end there and acknowledge for the MAB114 work, uh, this isn't even all of the people, but of course our partners in DOD, um, in Kinshasa, um, Kinshasa, both the Congolese and the CDC who have a great presence there, and of course everyone at the VRC, it really is a big team effort to move any of these things through development. So I will stop there um, and advance these to the next speaker. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was a great and really informative talk. Um, 
So now we're going to just move right forward along um, to Mike Diamond. Mike, thanks so much for taking time to speak with us today. Great. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, development of vaccines in, using preclinical models and sort of highlight some of the issues that we have in trying to understand SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and I think this might set up some also some topics that Barney probably will cover in the last talk. Um, I have some disclosures in terms of how my lab is funded and also my own independent funding. And I'm going to remind you, I'm not going to go into great detail about SARS-CoV-2. I think most of us who are probably following this lecture are aware that it is a virus that is certainly a respiratory virus, but not only a respiratory virus. And in humans, we see uh, not only do we see severe pneumonia, but we also see cardiac disease. We see evidence of metabolic disease hypercoagulability, hyperinflammatory status. And so this is actually a multi-system disease, which is actually very difficult to sort of understand at the pathogenesis in all aspects of it uh, just by studying humans. And so the, the, one of the goals is to really identify animal models that can be used to break down some of the particular parts of tropism, inflammation, and disease pathogenesis, and then to be able to use that to help to develop countermeasures and then to evaluate them. And that said, we also need to study human patients because some of the features that we see in animal models may not always predict exactly what's going to happen in the human condition where you have outbred situations, uh, different genetic back, uh, backgrounds, as well as comorbidities. So there's utility, at least I feel, and I think a number of us in the field do, that the mouse models have a role in studying SARS-CoV uh, pathogenesis and potentially a countermeasure development. So why mice? So there are certain aspects of the biology, pathogenesis, and tropism to study in vivo mechanistically that are much easier done in reductionist-based systems. Then these need to be validated in, uh, in uh, animals that are closer to humans, including non-human primates, uh, but then ultimately as in humans as well. We can understand uh, the significance of strain differences using reverse genetics. We can understand mechanisms of immunopathology, test countermeasures and therapeutics and vaccines. Mice are relatively high throughput, and this gives us statistical power to be able to distinguish whether something is working or not, or whether there's a certain feature of disease which is due to some aspect of immunity. And then we have a lot of genetics and immunologic tools in the mouse, both not only knockout mouse, CRISPRing in, CRISPRing out, but also collaborative cross-based mouse, which are genetic systems where there's a, an extraordinary amount of variability, which can then be used to track particular uh, phenotypes, either of resistance or susceptibility. The problem turns out that uh, mice don't get SARS-CoV-2 naturally. And this was anticipated from some of the earlier work in other coronaviruses, such as SARS-CoV, the original SARS, and, and Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, MERS. Uh, and uh, pro the problem is, is that um, many mice, I wouldn't say all mice, but many mice just do not get uh, productively infected. And so when we started looking at this, many others also, we looked at a range of mice here on the left, and if you infect them via intranasal route, these mice mostly gain weight. They don't show any evidence of disease. And uh, worse off for the virologist is that if you look in their lungs, which you would expect to see infection, many of these mice, whether they were laboratory strain, immunocompetent, outbred, inbred, uh, genetic knockouts and innate immunity, they just did not replicate virus at all. And we know now the reason, one of the major reasons why is because they do not express the human ACE2 receptor. They express a mouse ACE2 receptor. But unfortunately, as many studies now have shown, the mouse ACE2 receptor is not competent to engage SARS-CoV-2. There are a series of amino acids which have been defined by a number of investigators uh, to show that the mouse uh, uh, um, ortholog of this gene just does not support adequate binding, whereas the human one does, the monkey one does, the hamster one does, and other animal species as well. So how do you get around that? So what we did initially to try to address this question along with Stanley Perlman's group at Iowa separately and also uh, collaboratively with us is to introduce um, the, adno, uh, the ACE2 receptor via an adenoviral vector. And this allows transient expression in the lung, so here I'm showing you on the right, uh, just the, uh, over time, you can see we see an optimal expression about five days after adenovirus transduction in the lung. We see high levels of expression. If you look on the bottom by in situ hybridization, you can see um, uh, in the brown on the bottom that over time, you can get actually significant numbers of cells expressing the human ACE2 mRNA as well as the human ACE2 protein. So this allows us transit transduction as one model of this. And then because of that, now you're able to actually get productive infection. And so on the left are BALB-C mice, and then there's also B6 mice right next to it. 
In the black are what happens if you don't have the ACE2 receptor. This is input virus, and over time, the input virus goes rapidly away. It does it both in B. C. mice and in B6 mice. But in the green and the blue um, are some variations on this, but you can see that you get high levels of infection within one day, and these are sustained uh, for the first several four days or so. They ultimately, they go away by about day eight or so in this model, but you can get at least a week of very high level of infection in the lung. And this is um, visualized on the right if you look by in situ hybridization, whereby you can see in the untreated animals, there's no brown color. If we just administer the human ACE2 adenovirus but are now staining for the viral RNA, we don't really see any color. But here now, in this case on the right, you can see in the lung, in multiple regions of the lung, and it's, uh, it, the image is a little small, but you can see uh, eight, um, a viral RNA expression in the alveoli, as well as in the walls of the, um, uh, of the, of the bronchial, uh, of the small bronchioles as well, suggesting that you're able to get a productive infection and spread and dissemination associated with this. And indeed, if you look, um, uh, for pathology, so now this is um, H&E staining, uh, uh, hematoxylin and eosin staining of just tissue sections from the lungs. If you look at a naive animal, you can see nice aeration. There's no significant inflammation. The adenovirus delivery itself causes a little bit of inflammation, and this is one of the disadvantages of this model, which I'll talk about in a moment. However, if you add the SARS-CoV-2 at eight days, you can see significant consolidation. There's fibrinous uh, exudate. There's interstitial edema. And if you give an anti-interferon blocking antibody to allow in, even enhanced um, infection as well as inflammation, now you can see massive consolidation here. And these animals have very, very poor respiratory status, as you might imagine. So you're able to establish a model now by using trans transduction of the human ACE2 receptor via an adenovirus vector to create a model of uh, viral pneumonia, which is associated with high-level infection and high-level inflammation. And so the advantages of this model is it overcomes the failure uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike to not bind the mouse. Uh, we can do intranasal delivery and create a, a lung infection and disease pneumonia model, and it can be severe depending upon the condition. And by using this uh, transient transduction, you can essentially put it in any mouse, in any mouse background. And that's really important because now you can put this into knockout strains and then begin to understand uh, the genetics of, let's say, susceptibility or resistance or possibly uh, immune modulatory activities or otherwise. And these are studies that are ongoing in our labs as well as other labs. However, there's some disadvantages to this. Um, the, as I alluded to, the adenovirus delivery independently triggers a mild inflammatory response, and so this needs to be accounted for. Uh, it's multiple steps. You have to give the adenovirus, you've got to wait, and give the virus itself. So you're doing this all in ABSL3 conditions, which is a little bit challenging. We did not see significant infection outside of the lung in this model because we delivered the ACE2 um, uh, adenovirus intranasally. And so in humans, you do see evidence of GI tract infection. There's evidence of uh, at least viral RNA in the kidney. There's some pathology in the heart. We don't fully understand that, but we don't really see too much of this in this particular model where we deliver it directly. And it's a non-fatal um, uh, model. Even though they get severe weight loss and they also get severe lung disease, they all recover. And uh, that has, uh, I think that there's, most people actually recover. So this model does have some validity in that regard. Although if you want to look at it for protection against lethality, this model actually doesn't fit that bill. So how do we get further to create an even more severe model? So we generated a second model, and this was based using a transgenic mouse. So instead of delivering the human ACE2 receptor via an adenovirus, in this case, there was an existing ACE2 transgenic mouse that Stanley Perlman's group had generated in the context of SARS-CoV infection. And so what he did at the time, this is now almost 15 years ago, is he uh, put the human ACE2 transgene behind the K18 cytokeratin promoter in hopes of generating an essentially epithelial cell-specific expression of human ACE2, which would then facilitate SARS-CoV. I forgot to mention that uh, one of the reasons why SARS-CoV also didn't replicate particularly well in the mouse is because uh, the, uh, uh, the, the mouse, um, again, mouse ACE2 didn't really bind as well as the human ACE2 does for the original SARS as well as certainly for SARS-CoV-2. So in this model now, where we have um, uh, a transgenic model, so it's just very simple, you just intranasally inoculate those mice, you can see here we get very severe weight change. And in fact, this is a lethality model. By day eight, all of the mice 
uh, actually succumb to infection. We again see very high levels of viral, of viral uh, infectious virus. This is by uh, plaque assay. You can see we're at about seven to eight logs of infectious virus from day two to day four, even through day seven. Very high levels of viral RNA that are sustained over this period of time. So this is a very severe uh, viral infection in the lung model, more so than the ACE2 uh, transiently delivered, although that model could, uh, did have certainly a certain level of severity. When we look here, both by in situ hybridization on the right, you can see at day two, four, and seven, we have very high levels of viral RNA, the brown staining here, it's uh, um, disseminated throughout the lung. You can see in the, air, in the airway space, lining the, uh, the pneumocytes, as well as other alveolar cells. And by day seven, we have sort of a patchy infection, uh, which is associated actually with significant lung injury, and there's a lot of debris here you can't really appreciate. If you look by H&E, I think you can appreciate that at, at day two and day four, even though there's a lot of viral infection here, the airways still are actually pretty intact, but by day seven, just three days later, we see massive consolidation. There's also fibrinous excellent, exudate interstitial edema and some evidence of hemorrhage, many of which are features that we see in human disease as well. So this model has two interesting features to it. One is more severe disease, more severe inflammation, and then viral infection, which is separated in time from uh, inflammation. And so one question that still remains is how much of the injury is due to the virus itself or how much is due to the infiltrating immune response. We know that in humans, probably the pathogenesis is a combination of initial viral insult and infection and subsequent immune modulators. There's data, obviously, using dexamethasone in very sick patients, suggesting improvement, which would suggest at least some component of the immune response mediates this damage. And being able, being able to create small animal models that recapitulate some of these features is valuable, although whether the route by which you, you get there, in other words, whether the nature of this pathology is exactly the same as what we see in humans remains to be seen. I, I would suspect some of the features are shared and some may be different. You also can use these um, models to begin to address um, uh, what are particular signatures they may be associated with this. And just as an example, because it's a mouse, you can prospectively get samples from day zero, two, four, and seven. And then these are lung samples directly, and you can profile them. And you can see that uh, we see massive cytokine upregulation late in infection. We see an early interferon type 1 signature and also a very large interferon gamma signature late after infection. And so we can begin to see some of the features of, uh, of human disease where we see uh, early type 1 interferon responses in some patients, although some actually show suppressed responses, and then later highly pro-inflammatory responses, which are thought to be um, uh, due to the immune, infiltrating immune cells that come in, as well as potentially the infected cells contributing to this as well. So how do we use this? I'm just going to show a brief uh, story on, uh, on vaccines. Uh, I think Barney's probably going to cover a little bit more on this. I'm just going to briefly say that for SARS-CoV-2, there are literally hundreds of vaccines that are in development at various stages. Many, as you know, are, are aware, are in human trials, and some of them, two of them are in phase three trials already in the context of mRNA vaccines and also in adenovirus-based vaccines and also in activated vaccines in uh, different parts of the world. I'm going to focus a little bit on vectored vaccines because we used one as a pilot to try to begin to understand some of the pathogenesis features and some of the correlates of protection. And so one that we developed in my laboratory, which is a little different from one that is now in clinical trial, is a chimpanzee adenovirus a vectored vaccine, whereby um, we used a different serotype than one that's being used right now in trials of a, a, a chimp adenova um, uh, viral vector. The advantage of using a chimpanzee one is that you don't get um, uh, vector immunity. So if you use a human ad5, a lot of people in the population have antibodies or T cells that already recognize that, which could, in theory, reduce the efficacy of it. So we use this chimpanzee adenovirus vector. We put this, the entire spike protein in. We in included stabilizing mutations based on Jason McClellan's structural analysis. And this is a replication incompetent virus, so it cannot replicate itself. It's able to get into cells <clears throat> and then go through um, uh, translation and production of protein, but cannot spread. And then in contrast to what all of the clinical tr uh, trials that are ongoing now, we use intranasal dosing. In fact, we actually compared this to intramuscular dosing of this as a single dose, 10 to the 10th particles. And the reason we did this is because it's known that 
um, at least from a lot of uh, extensive work on flu and, and other uh, vaccine platforms, that intranasal administration of vaccines can uniquely generate mucosal immunity through the mucosal-associated lymphoid tissue or bronchial-associated lymphoid tissue by where you can generate IgA, uh, resonant memory T cells, and these can actually uh, uh, act as um, surveyors along the respiratory tract and generate either Ig, uh, IgA or IgG potentially, which can neutralize virus before it actually crosses the epithelial cell barrier, before it gets into the lung. And this has two potential advantages. One of them is you can prevent pneumonia, which you probably can prevent with systemic immunity. The other is you may be able to reduce transmission by not getting these epithelial cells infected in the first place. And so when we did this, um, I'm just showing you the data for the intranasal route of administration. I will mention the intramuscular route, but for the sake of time, I, don't, I, I can't go through all the data. We gave a single dose, and we waited a month, and then evaluated the immunogenicity. And here you can see we generate in blue very high levels of anti-spike protein antibodies, IgG in the serum, anti-RBD, -R the receptor binding domain. But we also generated very high levels of IgA against the S protein and RBD. When we administered the same vaccine via an intramuscular route, we got no IgA appreciably at all. We got good IgG responses. In both cases, we got pretty reasonable uh, neutralizing titers of greater than one to a thousand serum dilution. When we looked in the bronchial alveolo lavage fluid, we saw that the intranasal vaccine gave us IgG and IgA against the S and the RBD, but the intramuscular vaccine did not. And so we have two vaccines now given identical doses through different routes, both of them giving good systemic immunity, however, one of them giving uh, superior IgA and mucosal immunity, at least based on immunogenicity. We also looked at T cell responses, and the, in, both of them gave good systemic T cell responses. I'm not going to go into all of the details here, but only one of them gave uh, what we call likely to be resonant memory T cells or CD103 positive, CD69 positive antigen specific CDA T cells in the lung. And that was the one that we administered via the intranasal route. Also, we saw antigen secreting B cells in the local lymphoid tissues, both IgG and IgA, and those were only seen in the animals that got vaccinated via the intranasal route. When we looked at protection, both, virus, uh, both vaccines, the intramuscular and the intranasal, were able to protect against lung infection. I'm not showing you all the data here. This is uh, placable virus. This is viral RNA. But what is, was interesting was that this vaccine did better at, give it, at protecting against um, viral RNA levels in the lung, in the spleen, in the heart, and in the nasal turbinates as well. We had barely any virus in the, in the nasal turbinates and none in the nasal washes at all four days after infection. Whereas in the vaccine that we administered via an intramuscular route, these were positive, almost similar to the levels that we saw in, um, uh, in, the, in the control. So this vaccine was able to, via an intranasal route, was able to give superior protection in the, in the upper respiratory as well as the lower respiratory tract. And when we look by pathology, as you might imagine, this is the uh, systemic root protection, but it also looked the same for the intranasal. We were able to get protect completely against pneumonia here by both roots in the lung, but the real difference was also uh, the, the, the level of protection that we saw uh, in both the upper and lower airways associated with IN root. One of the other things that was really interesting was we looked at the induction of an NP response, so the vaccine only has spike, and so if you generate anti-NP antibodies after challenge, it suggests that you have substantial breakthrough infection. Of course, the control animals did, but the animals that were vaccinated via an intranasal route did not, whereas those that were vaccinated via an intramuscular route did. And this was true via, for anti-NP IgM or anti-NP IgG. And so this suggests to us that at least some of the animals probably achieved sterilizing immunity because they had no detectable infectious virus, almost no detectable viral RNA in the upper airway, and no detectable anti-NP response. So we think that intranasal, administra intranasal root administration may have benefits for preventing pneumonia, disrupting transmission because we prevent infection in the upper airway, and in theory could curtail the pandemic. That said, there's also benefit for intramuscular roots because they will prevent pneumonia, but they may or may not prevent upper airway infection. So let me just summarize what our, our work on the mouse uh, has uh, told us so far. So we can develop adenovirus transduced models using human ACE2 and use these for pathogenesis as well as really beginning to uh, dissect some of the genetic basis 
for uh, resistance and susceptibility by transducing this ACE2 into backgrounds whereby we may be modulating immune responses. The K18 ACE2 transgenic model is a more severe model of disease, may be ex exceptionally good for studying countermeasures, countermeasures that are antiviral in nature, countermeasures that are uh, anti-inflammatory in nature. Again, work in the mice is important, but needs to be validated in non-human primate studies as well as in human studies. This is a, a model and really for understanding some of the basis for what's going on, but it is not a, a one to be used in isolation. I do think that you can establish some of the virological and immunopathological features of disease. And then I showed you in the last part one example of a chimp adenoviral vector that we developed that showed a really enhanced efficacy when we administered via an intranasal route at the same dose. And we have uh, studies planned in non-human primates and hopefully in humans soon. And I think I'll stop there and just acknowledge the people in my laboratory that have done a lot of the work, many of our collaborators at Washington University, including David Curiel, who we work closely with on the adenovirus vectors, and Sean Whalen, who have been working on uh, some of the major projects uh, on SARS-CoV-2 with, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for such a nice talk, Mike. Super interesting how fast he's been able to come up with um, vaccines that are actually showing such great efficacy. Um, and now I'm moving on to my last talk for um, the webinar. I'd like to introduce Barney Graham. Barney, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Barney Graham. I'm the deputy director at the NIAID Vaccine Research Center. I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Dr. Sullivan mentioned and talk about how prototype pathogen preparedness enabled our rapid response to coronavirus uh, infection this year. Thinking about pandemic preparedness, we think there's three major uh, concepts, a platform approach, meaning manufacturing platform where plug and play technology allows rapid manufacturing. The priority pathogen approach is, is done by CEPI and WHO, in which a few selected pathogens of concern are put at the top of the list. And our group advocates for a prototype pathogen approach in which systemic, systematic uh, preparedness uh, for all virus families, all 25 virus families of concern uh, that are known to infect humans uh, is pursued. We think this is possible because of the new technologies that have transformed vaccinology over the last 12 years. Some of them uh, improve our precision, uh, such as structure-based vaccine design that I'll describe some today, uh, but also uh, our ability for single cell analysis that has improved our capacity for uh, uh, rapidly uh, discovering new <coughs> human monoclonal antibodies, antibody lineages for new molecular targets, or even uh, evaluating immune responses from our vaccination. There's also been great advances by protein engineers in how to make self-assembling nanoparticles that we can use to display our immunogens. We've also uh, generated new technologies to make things go faster, such as rapid DNA synthesis, uh, the ability to do genetic engineering, not just on cell lines for manufacturing, but on animal model development. And I'll discuss uh, today some of the ways in which nucleic acid and vector-based approaches have, have uh, increased our speed toward the clinic. For us, this began about 10 years ago when we started working on uh, de defining the structure of the prefusion form of the F protein of respiratory syncytial virus. And this was published in 2013, and the major finding was that uh, there are epitopes at the apex of the prefusion molecule that if uh, bound by antibodies can hold this uh, molecule together with a C-terminal trimerization domain so that this structure could be solved. These epitopes are highly neutralization sensitive and they, do, they disappear when the spontaneous uh, rearrangement of F occurs as it does on the virus surface or 
during the process of membrane fusion. These molecules in this conformation have been used for many decades trying to make subunit RSV vaccines and have always resulted in the same outcome of two to three fold increase in neutralizing activity. But if you use the C-terminal trimerization domain and some internal disulfide and cavity filling mutations to stabilize this molecule in the right conformation, you can now boost neutralizing activity by up to 16 fold, which opens up the feasibility of maternal immunization. So solving this atomic structure revealed a new target of vulnerability. And we now have clinical proof of concept for structure-based design uh, uh, with the focus on preserving neutralization sensitive epitopes. And we think this pre-fusion confirmation of class one fusion proteins uh, can be generalized as a vaccine target across other virus families. We've done that for pneumoviruses, paramyxoviruses, and now coronaviruses. And shortly after that F structure was solved, uh, MERS arose in the Middle East as the second major beta coronavirus uh, pandemic threat in the last 10 years, and we thought since there was, were no spike structures available at that time that we would focus on uh, solving that structure. Uh, MERS and SARS spikes turned out to be uh, unstable and difficult to solve, but uh, once we started working with one of the endemic beta coronaviruses, HKU1, shown here, which was inherently more stable, a collaboration with Jason McClellan at that time at Dartmouth and Andrew Ward allowed us to solve this pre-fusion structure of the human beta coronavirus spike. And when we had that, uh, we were able to identify stabilizing mutations, in this case, two proline molecules between the central helix and the heptad repeat one, that largely uh, prevents this molecule from rearranging. And it turned out that those two proline molecules not only stabilized HKU1, but they could be directly transferred into the analogous positions in MERS and SARS spikes and increased uh, uh, stability so that the uh, pre-fusion form of spike could be maintained thereby preserving these neutralization sensitive epitopes. And importantly, especially for gene-based vectors, uh, stabilization improved expression of transduced cells by up to 50 fold for the MERS. This uh, transferring these proline stabilizing mutations into endemic coronaviruses or veterinary coronaviruses or even SARS-like uh, potentially emerging coronaviruses uh, from bats uh, allowed the structural solution of the spike proteins of these many uh, different coronavirus species. So we know uh, that these four, the two alpha coronaviruses shown here and the two endemic coron uh, beta coronaviruses shown here have been with us for some time and now in 20 years there has been three uh, emergencies of uh, beta coronaviruses uh, as pandemic threats. Uh, the first SARS, MERS, and then the second SARS. We know this has been happening over hundreds of years, shown here. Uh, the, uh, genetic history suggests that uh, these uh, coronaviruses started entering humans about uh, several hundred years ago. And so it's likely that this will continue to happen and we need a generalizable solution for coronaviruses. And if we're gonna do pandemic response, we need something that we can uh, mobilize quickly. So after uh, several years of collaborating with Moderna on various uh, projects, including RSV and Zika, in 2017, we started a uh, deliberate program on pa uh, prototype uh, pathogen preparedness for uh, pandemic threats. By combining our precision vaccinology, meaning structure-based vaccine design, with their platform manufacturing technology that could rapidly manufacture an, an mRNA immunogen. And so this mRNA is packaged in a, in a lipid nanoparticle. It's pegylated. 
It can deliver a single strand of mRNA into the cytoplasm of a cell. It's translated into a, a protein a, as shown here. And this uh, uh, process, because it's synthetic and because it's uh, the same for each new protein expressed, uh, can be turned around very rapidly. And so we did that for both NEPA, a paramyxovirus, uh, F protein G chimera that we designed, and for MERS coronavirus that was stabilized with this two proline mutation. And we showed in mice for the MERS construct that uh, immunizing with either a one microgram or 0.1 microgram of uh, mRNA encapsulated in the lipid nanoparticle could protect mice from uh, what is otherwise a lethal challenge with the MERS and the uh, human DPP4 transgenic mice. And, and that a 0.01 microgram dose uh, allowed breakthrough infection to occur. So two important uh, pieces of information is that a relatively low dose of mRNA was able to protect. And in a dose that allowed breakthrough infection, the partial immunity resulted in partial protection and not enhancement of disease. So these mice had uh, transient weight loss and recovered instead of the enhancement uh, of disease that people have been concerned about on coronaviruses that would have put that green line on the left side of the gray line. So we found that a set of proline mutations could stabilize multiple coronaviruses into the prefusion S uh, conformation and that they were more immunogenic in that form and could also be expressed at higher levels and thought that this could be a generalized solution for beta coronavirus and uh, something that could be used in a rapid or platform manufacturing approach. So when uh, the new novel coronavirus was uh, announced at the end of 2019, uh, well, the new disease was announced. Uh, we wondered if it could be a beta coronavirus. At the time, we had planned to take the um, NEPA FG chimera forward in an mRNA program. We'd already gone through mice and ferrets and were planning to make the GMP lot for the human phase one trial with the idea of having that on the shelf uh, prior to future outbreaks. But on the 7th of January, when we learned that it was beta coronavirus, uh, discussions between leadership at Moderna and the VRC led to switching to the, um, the coronavirus project as something we could use as the demonstration project for this concept of prototype pathogen uh, preparedness. So um, when we woke up on January 11th, Saturday, and found the sequences of these new, uh, this new novel coronavirus online, we <laughs> applied the design that we uh, thought could work and stabilize the, the protein and, and ordered reagents uh, to, to make purified protein and probes and, and other things. And, then uh, agreed with Moderna, who at risk uh, agreed to make GMP product with their mRNA platform. And within 41 days, we're able to deliver a GMP grade quality product that could be uh, put into phase one clinical trials, which was accomplished within 65 days from the uh, original uh, sequence availability. And in the meantime, we did uh, make protein. Uh, Jason McClellan at UT Austin now solved the structure by cryo-EM of the spike protein. Knowing that it was in the right conformation allowed us to prepare uh, uh, lysa uh, reagents and develop assays that and confirm immunogenicity of both mRNA and protein in mice. And so the program was launched from that initial sequence availability. 
And uh, the main reason to go fast in the beginning is so you can uh, rapidly uh, achieve a product that could uh, impact the epidemic. And, and so uh, in order to do that, you have to do things in parallel. And so the plan uh, was established that was to identify, uh, de define immunogenicity in animal models before phase one, uh, show protection in animals before phase two, and demonstrate safety of the product uh, before phase three. We have done that. This is the spike protein as solved by uh, Dr. McClellan and his group uh, in collaborating with us. It is uh, very similar to the other spike glycoproteins we've solved in the past with this uh, dynamic receptor binding domain that flips up uh, in order to engage its receptor, the ACE2. Once you have this uh, structure defined, even without other reagents to uh, validate antigenicity, it allows you to make the elices as we did with CDC, the probes as we did with Abcellera to discover new antibodies that are now in clinical development at, at Lilly, and to apply it to vaccines, either the mRNA as we have done, or into other vectors or protein-based approaches as others have done. I'll describe some mouse data initially, um, building on what uh, Dr. Diamond presented earlier. Uh, we immunized three different strains of mice initially to uh, demonstrate immunogenicity, but I'll just show you uh, data from Balb C in which either two doses with a four a week challenge or a 13 week challenge or a single dose with a seven challenge were shown to protect mice. And one of the reasons I'm showing this is because the virus used for challenge was developed by Ralph Barrick, and it is a uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that has two amino acid modifications in the receptor binding domain that allow it to infect wild-type mouse mice and use the murine ACE2 receptor for entry. He's now adapted that virus through serial passage, and not only does it grow and infect mice, uh, but also now it uh, can cause a lethal infection in both young and old mice. So this is another uh, small animal model that we think is uh, very useful because it does infect uh, the right cells, it has the right tropism, it causes lethal disease, and it can be used in a, an animal model that can be um, uh, studied for immunological details of pathogenesis. So in the two dose or the one dose, you can achieve uh, decent levels of antibody response at one microgram twice or 10 micrograms once that translates into neutralizing activity in a pseudovirus neutralizing assay of around 1,000 uh, for one microgram twice or 10 micrograms once. These protect uh, mice at the one microgram dose uh, from in the lung and also largely prevent virus uh, replication uh, as detected by platforming units in the nose. And both one and 10 micrograms at a seven week challenge point uh, protect the lung. And that protection is uh, sustained at least beyond three months to 13 weeks, shown here uh, uh, protection from virus replication in the lung and the nose. And importantly, as we mentioned about the concern for enhanced disease, showing here the PBS controls with an acute inflammatory uh, reaction, uh, nodular neutrophilic uh, uh, nodules, and then on day in the PBS control group, and then by day four with some alveolar thickening and infiltrates largely of either lymphocytes or neutrophils. But in the groups that broke through at either 0.01 twice or 0.1 twice, you see um, an absence of both the acute lung injury and an absence of the alveolar infiltrates and neutrophilia that, that was uh, present in the uh, control groups. And so even in the breakthrough infection groups, there was no evidence of enhanced uh, disease or immunopathology.
You've also studied this in monkeys shown here. Uh, again, it's a two dose regimen at zero and four weeks with the challenge at eight weeks. We used a high dose challenge of eight times 10 to the fifth, given in both um, three mLs intratracheally and a half an mL in each stroll. We can show that uh, this is very immunogenic in, in non-human primates and uh, rhesus macaques. Uh, after the first injection, all animals respond with binding antibody major by ELISA at both the 10 and the 100 microgram dose level, and they all also boost after the second dose. And here are the responses compared to convalescent sera from uh, humans. And you see that the uh, antibody responses are in the upper tier of what a human would make uh, after uh, recovering from SARS-CoV-2. Here are functional antibody response measurements, either by uh, pseudovirus neutralization or uh, ACE2 binding inhibition, or by a live virus reporter uh, assay using a nanoloop. Uh, reporter uh, done in Ralph Barrick's lab at UNC. And you see in all cases that the uh, animals, especially at 100 microgram dose level, uh, were inducing responses that exceeded uh, the convalescent sera uh, from recovered humans. We also looked at T cell responses. And uh, as expected, based on the mouse data, there was a strong Th2, Th1 biased CD4 T cell response, as shown here, uh, at the, especially obvious at the 100 microgram uh, dose level, with very little, if any, uh, Th2 cytokines detected, either IL-4 or IL-13, was uh, not detected. And then other, uh, uh, to look at other uh, subsets of the CD4 T cell response, we show here uh, IL-21 positive T cells suggesting that this vaccine has induced a robust uh, T follicular helper cell response that we think is important for expanding and activating uh, responses in the uh, germinal centers. This level of antibody response, looking at subgenomic RNA, suggested uh, uh, that this would be replicating virus, protected both or rapidly cleared virus from both lungs at the 10 microgram or 100 microgram dose compared to the controls, or uh, also from nose, especially at the 100 microgram dose level, uh, uh, with some protection at, at the day four time point in the uh, nasal swab. So early uh, and more rapid clearance of virus in both lung and nose. We've now uh, reported the early uh, results from our uh, phase one clinical trial, the interim data from uh, the 25, 100, and 250 microgram dose level, again given at zero and four weeks. And Again, looking now just at the neutralizing activity by pseudovirus or uh, plaque reduction neutralization assay done in the laboratory of Dr. Mark Dennison at Vanderbilt University, uh, you can show that in people at 250 or even 100 micrograms that the neutralizing activity induced after two doses of this mRNA-1273 is uh, in the upper tier of convalescent uh, human responses. T cell responses in the human subjects also suggested a very Th1 biased response and very little, if any, Th2 uh, response detected using uh, peptide overlapping peptide pools from the spike protein. And um, some CD8 T cells were also induced uh, at, at a very low level. I've shown you data from mice, monkeys, and humans uh, demonstrating immunogenicity of the mRNA-1273 product. Also protection of both lung and nose in the mice and the monkeys. And safety data suggesting a Th1 biased response, absence of Th2 responses. And all of these data have now been published as shown below.
In summary, uh, product development and clinical evaluation started in record time because of prior fundamental, basic, and translational research that had gone on for many years. Improvements in precision vaccinology because of new technologies, largely structure-based vaccine design. Concepts of prototype pathogen preparedness, which had focused on a single beta coronavirus intensively to uh, develop concepts that could be generalizable to other beta coronaviruses. And a pre-established public-private partnership in which uh, that allowed rapid manufacturing uh, decisions to be made because of trust and, and prior data. mRNA-1273 is immunogenic and well tolerated in mice, non-human primates, and humans. It is protective in mice and non-human primates in both upper and lower airways. And these data allowed a phase three trial to start on July 27, uh, just a little over six months from the time of sequence release. I want to thank the uh, principal investigators and program heads that I work with every day, especially John Moscola, who is our director and uh, has been involved in this work from the beginning. Dr. Jason McLellan, who is a fellow at NIH in Peter Kwong's lab when we did the RSV uh, structure work. He is now a faculty member at UT Austin, where we continue to work on coronaviruses and other projects uh, together. Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, pictured here, uh, was, is the leader of our small coronavirus team, at least it was small before this outbreak, and uh, studying both uh, the immunology and uh, basic biology of coronaviruses to prepare for this. And Dr. Caitlin Morabito, a project uh, manager in our group, who was uh, very important for this work. Our collaborators at Moderna who provided the mRNA and who we've uh, done a lot of the preclinical development uh, in close collaboration. Dr. Ralph Barrick at UNC and Mark Dennison at Vanderbilt, long-term collaborators. And I want to thank the um, organization and investigators at DMID uh, within NIAD who held the IND and sponsored this phase one clinical trial with Lisa Jackson, the principal investigator in Seattle, and uh, were able to initiate that in uh, re record time. So thank you very much, uh, and I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Barney, for that really nice presentation and overlook as to what you and your group have been um, doing these last several months. Um, and thank you again to our three speakers for sharing their really exciting discoveries. Um, we're going to take a few minutes to go over some uh, questions. Um, I realize we're just at the top of the hour now, but I think if we can take maybe five or so minutes to answer some questions, that would be great. Um, so the first question um, from one of our listeners was actually for Nancy, um, and it is, what is the half-life of MAB114 in monkeys, and what is the time post-infection when the antibody is no longer effective? Uh, so the, the half-life in monkeys is about 23 days, um, and it turns out it's about the same in humans. It's 24 days in humans. Um, when we look at, I think it's the two-month time point, you know, 60 days at the concentration of MAB114 that's still circulating, um, it's about 500 to 1,000 times the IC50 for neutralization. We haven't walked out the time post-infection to see how long it would be protective. I, I guess the question is referring to a subsequent challenge or a subsequent infection. I think for Ebola, you know, it, it, the, the infection is, is really resolving within a couple of weeks, and we see the impact of the monoclonals pretty quickly. So we're, we're not envisioning that we would need to have it around for a long time. All right, great. Um, and the next question is for Mike. Um, how much SARS-CoV-2 replication occurs in the airways 
the mucosal surface where IgA antibody is present and potentially effective versus the alveolar tissues, which are devoid of IgA and thus vaccinating to produce IgA would likely be of no effect if this was the major site of viral replication in the lung. But I think there's two things there. One is, is that um, while there is more replication in the lung than there is in the upper airways, if you prevent the virus from getting from the upper airways to the lung, you will stop infection. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I would not say there's no IgA in the lung. There's probably some IgA that gets into the alveolar space, certainly when there's some level of inflammation, and certainly with IgG, just that IgA will preferentially get transported via the poly-IG receptor across into mucosal surfaces, but it is still present at some level um, in systemic circulation, certainly because it's being produced not only locally, but also in, uh, in lymphoid tissue. As we showed that you can see IgA secreting um, B cells in lymphoid tissue, as well as IgA in uh, mucosal, mucosal solutions, as well as in, in the lung. So I think it's present in both. It does get concentrated, certainly. But I think the major issue here is that it's not how much virus is actually replicating per se. It's if you, you need to stop it from getting to the lung as step one, and then step two, you also need to be able to have a mechanism for clearing it if it did get to the lung. Great, thank you. Um, and the third question is for Barney, and they're wondering what route of administration have you tested uh, your mRNA-based vaccine with? Um, this has all been done intramuscularly, uh, and and it induces enough systemic immunity that we can generate antibody responses that protect the lower airway and also the upper airway. And uh, I just wanted to mention, in addition to the animal, small animal models Mike has uh, reviewed, we've been working with Ralph Barrick, who made two modifications in the spike RBD and was able to infect mice enough to do serial um, transfer and generate viruses that can now robustly infect mice, cause disease, and cause uh, relevant pathology. And so I think there's a number of small animal models, including the new adapted virus, that uh, are useful to start understanding the details of immunity. Great, thank you. Um, and Mike, again, they're wondering if you have looked at um, immune responses other than antibody responses, so for instance, T-cells? So we did look at T-cells. I sort of glossed over it a little bit. Um, we do see CD4 T-cell and CD8 T-cell responses uh, with both vaccines. Um, the CD8 T-cell responses actually are a little bit better than the CD4s in our hands with this particular vaccine um, in the mouse. Uh, that could vary uh, across species, uh, obviously depending upon the immunogenicity of the peptides uh, and how they're presented. Um, in the intramuscular and intranasal ones, we saw relatively equivalent systemic CD8 T cell responses. But um, again, when we looked for um, local T cell responses and what might be resident memory T cell responses, I don't think we've proven that they are resident memory because there's a lot higher bar for that, but based on phenotypic markers, it, they're consistent with being resident memory T cells in the, in the lung, uh, and those are induced via intranasal inoculation, not via intramuscular. I think I wanna just qualify one thing, is to say that certainly there are vaccines that are induced by intramuscular route that provide stellar protection in preclinical models, and also we've seen data in humans, and I think Barney has alluded to that. I think what we did here in my case was to compare an identical vaccine formulation to see if there would be additional benefit. That's not to say that one couldn't still have absolutely good vaccines via intramuscular route, but there certainly was a benefit in our hands in this preclinical model of using an intranasal vaccine. Whether that holds for other vaccines, I think we'll have to see. Great. Um, I think we're up to maybe the last question, which I would like to ask broadly to all three of you. And I think it hits also on um, what some of the audience is also touching on. Um, so one of the big differences seems when you're working 
in outbreaks and pandemics is there's a massive ethical conundrum because you have patients that are really severely sick yet maybe no approved um, therapeutics um, to administer to them. Um, and likewise, as we're seeing with the case of SARS-CoV-2, there's just this massive ongoing spread. Um, so I want to see um, basically what your take is, if you can comment on maybe differences from um, working normal non-outbreak versus what you're happy to deal with now ethically. Um, Nancy, you, you touched on this a little bit um, when you were starting to um, give, administer your uh, therapeutic antibody to patients. So I was wondering if you could comment maybe a little further on this. Um, I just want to make sure I understand your question, Amanda. It sounds like you're asking um, what is the ethical, ethical conundrum when you have to decide who gets treated? Is that your question? Yes, who gets treated, maybe how people um, get treated. Um, you know, you have a potential therapeutic. You, you normally in science, you want to do a placebo control, but yeah. that might not always be possible. Yeah. So initially, um, this was administered under emergency use authorization and under what WHO calls MURI, which is really the, it's compassionate use. Um, and it really relied, again, on, on NGO partners in Congo. It's very difficult to administer any medication there. And so it was MSF and Alima and others who had set up Ebola treatment units and really were keen to deliver these, these different experimental medicines. And, and you're right, that was, that was a conundrum for who gets what. And under those conditions, it's usually the physician who's treating, who makes the call based on the patient's conditions, what they should get. And that made it all the more important for a randomized control trial to be set up because when you're giving it under emergency use, use you don't really know if it's helping or not or if something is helping more than something else. And so those randomized control trials are, are absolutely critical. And I think we're seeing that even with SARS-CoV-2. There are some things that are done in randomized control trials and other things that aren't. And I think we think that the RCTs really are the gold standard for understanding and being able to deliver therapeutics broadly. Thank you. Um, and Barney, maybe we can go with you next. Um, you know, there's with uh, vaccines coming so rapidly and we're seeing some vaccines going into humans without um, real animal data. I'm wondering if you could comment on, on what you're seeing in this sort of ethical dilemma. Well, vaccines have a higher safety bar than therapeutics because all of them are going into otherwise healthy people. And um, so there is a very large safety bar that we are focused on in vaccine development. And even though what we've done has gone fast, I don't think we've skipped any steps. Um, we had animal data before we injected the first subject. We knew it was immunogenic. We had protection data before it went to phase two in both mice and monkeys. And we had safety data in phase one and mice and in monkeys before we went to phase three. And so we had a pretty robust uh, package of information on safety and immunogenicity and protection before these went into advanced phase trials. And I think the thing that has been put at risk mostly is time and money because uh, we have gone fast, but I don't think safety has been compromised in, in the way we've done this uh, to date. Great, and Mike? I, w I would agree with both Nancy and, and Barney here. I, I think there are two safety issues perhaps that, uh, that have come up and so far we've not seen any red flags. Uh, um, one of them being a, one that we had, that maybe the field discussed and didn't do and the other one being one that we're watching for. And that is, as Barney alluded to, there is a, a theoretical possibility based on coronaviruses of enhancement of, um, uh, of disease associated with immune enhancement, whether that's due to 
direct antibody, non-neutralizing antibodies in a canonical antibody enhancement way or through TH2 uh, skewing, neither of which has been seen in any of the vaccine trials so far, which I think is really good news and uh, really makes us feel uh, uh, pretty good about this not being an issue. That said, we only will know, uh, I think, in some respects as we go out in time. So durability becomes a safety issue. In other words, how durable are the responses? What happens six months out, a year out, two years out? Do we need to boost or not? And these are going to have to be monitored over time. And there's no way to know because it's just too early and too soon. However, all of the signs that we've been seeing so far have been that this has not been an issue, which I think is um, is important. And, and the second one uh, came up as an issue early on, which I don't think anybody has really dealt with in the sense of we didn't actually do it, which was how, what's the fastest way to deploy a vaccine? And there were a number of people that were proposing to do human trials, so trials with a vaccine and then challenging them with infectious SARS-CoV-2 in those who would be at very low risk, for example, young people, healthy people, no other comorbidities. Obviously, not having a true antiviral drug that we all felt was going to stop it, stop the virus in its tracks, if you will, um, really, I think, precluded us from doing that. But that would be a very fast route if we, if we had, if remdesivir was a better drug than it is, or we had another direct-acting antiviral or a combination which we knew could really stop disease. But this was one that was debated, I think, uh, by a number of people because it could substantially shorten the, the length of the, and size of the trials uh, to be able to establish efficacy quicker. But I just don't think we had all of the tools to be able to do it, unfortunately. Great. Thank you. And with that, I think we've come to the end of our session. We'd again like to thank all of our speakers, Nancy Sullivan, Mike Diamond, and Barney Graham, for their engaging presentations. We are also very grateful to our sponsor, Sino Biological, for the contributions that made this webinar possible. We'd also like to thank you, the audience, for tuning in today to learn more about therapies and vaccine development in emerging and re-emerging diseases. If you would like to listen to this webinar again, it will be on demand shortly. If you would like to learn more about this topic, there is what promises to be an amazing and timely symposium scheduled for October 2021 on viruses and health and disease. Please check out cell.com for our on-demand viewing and more information on the symposium. If you have any comments about this webinar or suggestions for future topics, we'd love to hear from you by email at cpwebinars at cell.com. Thank you.